Welcome to another episode of Show Up with Sarah. I am very happy to have my guest here today, who Human Radfar, who whom is a longtime family friend acquaintance. Uh, it's really crazy to think that I have technically known you since I was like on uh, like 11, 12. And like so, um, for anybody, for no one knows this, uh, but I grew up in Upper Saint Clair. And Human grew up there with his, the Radfar family, and he was friends with my older brother, and that's how I got to meet Human. And then when I went to school outside of DC at George Mason University, um, Human actually lived in Arlington, Virginia at the time, so it was like I had kind of like a faux big bro in town. Um, and he lives out in San Francisco now. I'm in Denver and we have stayed connected via like LinkedIn and Facebook. And I was like, hey, human, would you do me the honor of being a guest on my podcast? And he said, yes. So welcome, human. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to do this. I love, I love this kind of thing. So and even more excited to uh, do this with you. Oh, thank you. Um, so for people who may not know, um, and the list of what human has invested in is, is expansive, it's long, but you know, he was the founder of Add This, he has invested in Uber and Sweetgreen and everything under the sun, and um, he now owns, is the founder of The Collective, uh, which is a back-end, well, you know what, I'm going to have you describe it because I'm just going to like read what is on the website and then you can actually give it life. So explain to the listeners what the collective is. Sure, sure. Uh, so collective is actually designed for solopreneurs. I know you've uh, been a solopreneur, so you understand uh, that, but really we call them businesses of one. So for those of you all that uh, are listening, sometimes you call the freelancer. Some of you don't wanna be called freelancers, you're professionals. So like my parents were psychiatrists or maybe you're a designer. And so there's 36% of the workforce today that are business of one. So we want to help those folks focus on their passion, not their paperwork. So think about, you know, all the things that you consider paperwork. You probably spend one out of four hours on things like formation and corporate compliance, bookkeeping, payroll, taxes, so on and so forth. So, you know, to Sarah's point, we built the first online back office in the cloud that's just dedicated specifically to this group. And uh, we'll handle company formation, um, bookkeeping, payroll, and tax. And uh, we're really about delivering results, right? So uh, we, we save, I think, our average member now like almost $10,000 a year. And so yeah. we're pretty excited about that. Uh, so it's fun. And this is pretty personal for me because I think, as you know, Sarah, like both my parents ran their own businesses, didn't think of them that way. I often didn't think of a lot of my friends as running businesses and family. But as we run this business, you start to realize so many people are business owners. They may not even treat themselves you know, that way they just may be hanging up a shingle, whether, you know, coaching or training and what have you, well, those are businesses. Uh, that is true. And I feel like uh, my mother, when I like adding like the collective, I probably will do it like eight more times during this uh, recording. My mom is in this really great habit of adding the or S's onto things. It's a uh, beautiful trait. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, That's okay. Uh, so we have briefly spoken about kind of just like what this podcast was going to be. And one of the reasons why I really wanted you to be on it, and you've been on my list since I started this podcast last year of like, I really want human on is because no pressure. I, and well, it's because I don't, you definitely don't know how much you've actually influenced uh, a lot of my thinking over the years. And um, and I've told a number of people this, and I think about you almost every client call, because when we, when I was in, in, when we were back in Arlington and you probably don't even remember this, which is super dope and cool, but I had just gotten broken up with by an ex. And the plan was that I was going to, to move out to Illinois with him and we were going to like be together and I was going to figure things out. And then he broke up with me and, you know, I was just like depressed and life sucked. And I had just started this job at the National Apartment Association and I called you and I was like, Hey, like, can I have a talk to you? And you're like, yeah, you took me out to brunch. And I just remember how I was recounting how everything sucked. And you're like, oh, 
I'm just so excited for you. And I was like, Jeff, I definitely just feel like you don't hear me, anything I'm saying at all, because everything sucks. And you were telling me about how you were in a similar position with like getting out of college, you had a relationship that ended, you're trying to start your business and how everything was just kind of in a suck space as well. And how you like blew through a ton of money and like the first, first round or getting your, your business going. And you were just like, you're just, it's so so exciting because you're in a position to do so much. And you gave me a really good building block at that point, which was, I was like, you know, well, I, I need to move. I need to move. I don't know where I'm moving, but I need to move. And you're like, yeah, you're trying to go A to Z and you need to go A to B. Like, can you afford to move? And I was like, well, no. And you're like, well, then just take it off the table. Right. And so I, I remember how frustrated I felt with how enthusiastic you were, but in the year since I have, I've, I've done that a lot with myself where I'm like, okay, Sarah, you are going A to Z and you need to go A to B and then B to C and C to D. And then it's funny because now that I'm on the other side with my mental health, getting aligned with what I'm supposed to be doing, um, be more focused in my life. And I talk to clients and they're like, Sarah, everything sucks. And I'm like, this is the most exciting time of your life, you know? And I like think about you and I'm like, wow, like I, I get what, what human was saying. Right. And so I'm curious, how often do you still use any of that mindset? And if you do, how often do you use it for yourself, for the people that you work with, for the businesses that you invest uh, in, because it's easy for me to sit here and look at you and be like, okay, human knows what he's doing. He, he has the experience, the money, the resources, the people, he can start a new business and he's going to be, he's just going to blow it off. Right. And I, I'm all the way back here where I'm like, I'm just trying to make consistent 10 K a month. And there are months where I'm like, I made a thousand and that's great. And then there are months where I'm like, I hit a 10 K and this is amazing. Right. So every, the Canyon between you and me sometimes feels aggressively huge, but then I'm like, really what it is, is it's a lot of a to B, B to C, C to D. And when we had rift before, um, one of the things that I talked to you about was what it's like to be on this side where you are inundated with people telling you, you should be working 24 hours a day, um, grinding all the time, waking up at 3am doing all the things. And then you also should be making 10 K a month traveling, kind of just working three hours a day. It's super easy. And for entrepreneurs right now, it's, it's a really hard place to be. Cause you think that you're doing everything wrong all the time. Um, you also think that you're really, really behind when I think, I I don't think that people have a good grasp of how much time it takes to get a business up and going. Um, so yeah, like I am curious for your own businesses, for the businesses that you invest in, the people that you may mentor or whatever, um, do you still have any of that A to B mindset? Uh, for sure. I mean, look, uh, first and foremost, I think, uh, appreciate, you know, all of the pump up. I feel, I feel much better, but, uh, I, I think we enter this conversation, you know, I'm, I'm a human being. I have my ups, I have my downs. Uh, I think everyone needs to look at, it's so easy to take someone in particular, I mean, using Instagram and paint this picture, right. It's almost like it could be a house of cards, right? So you see someone on Instagram and you paint this life and you project, all these feelings that you have, oh, well, they must have it figured out. They must have their budgeting done. They must be made, like I'm doing something wrong, mm-hmm. right? And the fact remains is we're all human beings. And so there's probably some flaw, but there's probably some, by the way, there are some people who just, I want to say figure it out, but they've, they've gotten their package to a place which is better than other people. That's true too. Yeah. But the reality is, is we're all probably more flawed, more vulnerable than, uh, you know, we care to admit, my, myself included. And, and as you know, like had my own mental health you know, battles and, and things weren't all up into the right for me by any means. I think often if you were to like, just go look at someone's LinkedIn or look at a career trajectory, it gets boiled down to let's call it a resume. So you take one page and you put some bullets. Well, you know, I've been alive almost 42 years. So if you put a bunch of bullets on there, yeah, everything was fucking good. Right. Yeah. So that's great. But if it's, it's what's in between those bullets. It's all of the words that are missing. It's all of those nights where like, you know, we almost shut down the company or almost you know, ran out of money or, you know, we went in the wrong direction or I had an ulcer. I mean, there's all that's not on your resume. 
right? Nor is it on your Instagram, nor is it on your LinkedIn. So I think, you know, part of, I think being successful, sorry, my dog is going crazy. Part of being uh, successful over time is creating this, I don't know, forgiveness and understanding uh, that you are going to fall. And like the best venture capitalists hit one out of 10, the best baseball players hit one out of three, right? So yeah. if these are the best in the world in their field, why are you expecting you're going to hit 100%? That's not realistic, right? So you have to operate knowing that you are, failure needs to be built into the system. In fact, you need to, you need to encourage that. So that's point one, I would say, with respect to that. So, second, you said, okay, well, do you go A to B? Absolutely. So for anyone who's in a period of decision-making, <clears throat> oftentimes, you know, when I sit down with founders or even my, my team or, or myself, you know, you're overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, there's so many, I can go left, I can go right. There's all these possibilities. Really? Maybe not. So like, for example, if you take a pre-seed founder and they have raised, I don't know, $500,000, a million dollars, and they say, oh, we could do all these things. The reality is you can't. When you look at your cash balance and you sit down and you look at it and you say, well, actually, no, you only have, I'm making this up, eight months of cash, which means you have to be out raising, I'm making this up, and four months, which means you only have four months, which means you, if you want to change something major in your product, you only have like two months, right? So you, it restricts your choices. And that can help that you can feel despondent when you restrict choices. But to me, that's free. Yeah. When someone says to you, you can go left or right, right? There's no paradox of choice. Yeah. You have a really quick decision to make versus like, I have infinite possibilities. Yes. On a long period of time, we can create amazing lives and you have infinite possibilities, but in a very, very short run, you can reduce a lot of things to what are you going to do right now? Make a decision. And by the way, not make a decision. That's a decision. Yeah. So I, yes, I guess that's my long winded way of saying, I think you have to think long, you have to be strategic, but ultimately punching through really tough times is about boiling it down to, am I going to go left or right and going from A to B? That's it. Do you think that if there is, because I, I want to believe that the right answer between the grind 20 hours a day and um, it should be easy and just manifest it and do the work, but then also travel all the time, the right answer is in between. Um, do you, what do you see now more than ever? Do you see entrepreneurs burning themselves out because they're just working nonstop? Or do you see entrepreneurs who don't seem to have the, 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 the work ethic and the fight? Um, so I'll answer your question, but I, I'll, I'll comment also on the first statement, which is like, what's the right answer? I think that's an important yeah. question that people ask. And I think we should respond to that as well. So with respect to what I see in entrepreneurs now, look, it's a self, it's a biased pool, right? So when I work with an entrepreneur, for example, like I met when I was, uh, finishing up, uh, when I was investing at full time versus doing collective, I probably met 400 companies to get to 10. So that pool of 10 you self-select people that have certain qualities, certain characteristics. I, I often told my team, I'm like, the best entrepreneurs that we'll pick, it's like a train, okay? The train stops, you get a chance to jump on every once in a while, but that train's going where it's going regardless of whether you're on it or not. That's a good entrepreneur, right? And so that's not just work ethic, that's really grit, that's resiliency, that's drive. That, that doesn't mean they're, again, they're not hitting, they're not batting a thousand, right? Yeah. But they are gonna keep going. They're going to keep learning. And if they're going the wrong direction, they're going to reroute. Like they, they are on their own mission. And I think that's important. Now, with respect to what's right and wrong, I think this is um, a question that's become loaded. And I think there's a, a whole cadre of folks that have become coaches and everyone's making money on content and whatever saying what's right and wrong. I don't believe that personally. I don't think that, I don't think an absolute right and wrong. I think what's right for you and what's wrong for you is the important question. Now that requires that you understand yourself and put a lot of work in. And that's a, that's a journey. I think we're all going to keep trying to hone what our understanding of ourselves is until the, the, the day we you know, move on to the next adventure, right? But if you said to me, human, should I be working 20 hours a day versus going on vacation all the time somewhere in the middle? Well, I'd say, what do you want to do, right? And so if you told me, hey, I want to make whatever, X thousand dollars and I'm currently at Y, I'd say, well, how important is that to you right now? And if, yeah. if that's the most important thing, then right now, I would probably sacrifice the vacations. Now, you would say, well, vacations are important to me. I said, well, can you hold off on a year? Can you hold off on two years? How long can you hold to get to that point where you can now have that balance? So when I look at balance, people say, well, like, how important is work-life balance? Often I get people who are applying to collective. Do you believe in work-life balance? Sure, I absolutely do. Yeah. But I don't think 
there's such a thing as an absolute work-life balance. And I think that's critical for people to understand. You're going to create a new company from scratch when you're under-resourced, you have none of capital of time. Your balance point is going to be fundamentally different than if you're running Google, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm not suggesting one job is easier than the other, but it's like cars, right? So if you're like cornering on an SUV, you don't corner an SUV at like 120 miles an hour. You're going to flip because <laughs> yeah. the center yeah. of balance is up there. If you're cornering on a Ferrari, it turns out you can go pretty fast. Yeah, They're both balanced different centers of gravity. And, and that is dynamic for a human being. So I think you have to look at your goals. You have to look at what your resources are and you have to make that decision and it'll change. You have to be okay with that change. Some years, you know, there was times I was going on vacation. I was going to five countries a year. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I, I haven't, I, the first time I left the country the last three years was, was for my wedding. Right. Yeah. And so, okay, well, am I failing? Am I hitting that balance point? No. Um, some, I, I work a lot now. I work six days a week. I wasn't doing that before. Um, you know, there was a time at, at this, I was working hundred hours a week. And so uh, I can tell you for me that that wasn't a healthy balance at points, Yeah. but I feel healthy now and I work out and I meditate. I spend time with my wife. I spend time with my family and I feel like I am okay. And that's the most important thing. You just can't, no one can answer that for you. You know, you just said something that uh, I was already planning on asking, but I know that <clears throat> the discussion around mental health is a lot bigger these days. And uh, the mental health of entrepreneurs and solopreneurs as you know, like uh, you work with is something that is, I think, very specific because there's a lot of up and down when you are a solopreneur. There's a lot of shaming or guilting. I should be working more. I should be doing these things more. I should be like a lot of shooting all over ourselves. So um, what is one of the best decisions you've ever made for your mental health over, I would say probably the past five years? Well, again, I think you're, you're, you're doing a good job here because like I'm, I'm thinking about two points here. So I'll answer your question, but yeah. let's talk about should for a second. Yeah. Okay. Should implies what? So when you say I should work more, I should make more money. Okay. Well, who, who says, right? So there's, you might say, well, society. Okay. This is an amorphous term. So, okay, now you might narrow it. Well, the people that I hang out with, they believe this. Are they in charge of you? Are they going to go with you after you pass away? Are they they following you to the bathroom when you go to the bathroom? No, they're Mm -hmm. not in charge of your life. You are in charge of your life. So I think one of the most freeing things that people can do, not just as an entrepreneur, but as a human being, is to remove should. It's fake. It's not real. It's just not. Now, are there expectations that people have that society has that they want to project and impose on the people because it makes them feel better. Sure. But like when you say should, like, for example, I can, you think that there's this terminal point that if you hit it somehow that you made made money, like I've hit so many goals and I can tell you as soon as you hit them, your relative basis changes, yeah. right? Like I have friends that started Uber, right? I have multiple friends that started billion dollar companies. So, okay. I, I'm the same age as them. I worked as hard as they are. I think I'm smart as they are. Should I just, I should keep going and I could realize my potential. Okay, well, the answer is fuck should, mm-hmm. right? And do I want to do that? And if I don't, and I want to spend more time with family, then that is what I, I need to do. So I think that's number one. On Number two on mental health. So the number one thing I did to answer your question is I, I removed the should mm-hmm. and I looked at what I want and that's hard. Because then you have to start looking at yourself and saying, okay, well, what is my ideal self that will make me feel better? What makes me feel good? What makes me feel satisfied? And study yourself, be a student of yourself and be like, okay, look, like I know that if I work out every day for the most part, right? Like I can skip a day or two, I feel much better. I know if I start my day with meditation, I feel much better. So I have a running document called daily routine, weekly routine quarter routine, and I'll just add to it and I'll edit it. So I started realizing that and I, I'm, I'm experimenting with myself. So, you know, one of my friends is Tim Ferriss and Tim has this um, almost like a hacking mentality to himself. And, and I think he takes it to a different level than I do, but I do yeah. appreciate this concept of like, you know, like study yourself and start to understand yourself. And, and, and ultimately all that matters is that you're fulfilled and actualized throughout the day and the scale of the universe and the scale of time. Does it matter if you made a million or 2 million? Do you think you're gonna be more remembered? because of that extra million or less remembered? You don't think you'll be washed away in a hundred years if you have extra million? Like you can play this game on any side. So ultimately the limited number of years, people should enjoy those years 
And we could talk about what does that mean, but um, I, I think should is a very, very loaded and dangerous concept that should be should be removed from mental health. I, no, I mean, I completely agree with you. One of the things I tell my clients is that should is a self-shaming statement. And if it's something that you should do, it can it if you can do it, then go do it. Oh, I should go work out. Okay, then just go, right? Like, and then it's not something that you're holding over yourself. But the other thing that I tell my clients is, the, you may be disappointed when you work with me because you are thinking I should have the house. I should have the car. I should have the, the, this and this and this and this. And when you become more self-aware, you may realize you don't want any of it. And like, what happens when you know what you want and it's confronted and having to be placed next to what you should be doing. Which one are you going to walk with? Because if you think that you should have the condo downtown and have the nice car and do all the things, but you realize what you want is to own like a little farmhouse out of the city with a couple of chickens, what, what are you going to do? You know, and most people don't have the self-awareness to be able to A, get to that, which you were saying is hard. Um, but then also the confidence to be like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go with the farmhouse with a couple chickens. Cause it's what I truly want because all their brain says is, but I, sh but I should, because I think it comes to what you're just saying, what am I going to be remembered for? I don't want to be forgotten. Um, which... well, the reality of it is, I think if you accept is that if you look at again on a purely, you know, empirical perspective, you will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't mean your impact is not there. And in fact, I can argue to you that there's probably people like who had a bigger impact, Bill Gates's mom or the guy who started a billion dollar company you never heard of. Bill you don't know. Gates's mom, I guess. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, but, but then she wasn't, she wasn't one of the wealthiest people alive. She yeah. didn't start the software revolution, but had she not done what she did, we wouldn't have that person. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I would say that what about her mom? Yeah. And you can go down the chain. And so the reality of it is none of, we are all a collection of people's actions and efforts over a scale of time. You, you, you should just enjoy that unique experience of being that person, but you know, nobody, and it's truly empirical, at least to our understanding is more important than another person on that scale. In a human societal perspective, based on some framework, maybe during your life, but again, if you're, you know, lying there on your bed at the end, when you're thinking, are you going to be like, you know, man, I really regret not going to prom and asking X, Y, and Z, or you're going to remember it, you know? And so that's the kind of stuff that I, I encourage that entrepreneurs look at. And I think you have to be really careful. Again, I think that word should, you know, you triggered that response. I think that's a really excellent way when you refer, if your happiness is contingent on things outside of you, you are destined to be unhappy. It is a fact. So when you look at Buddhism, the core tenant, the core tenant is there is suffering in the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the suffering comes from attachment. Okay. Yep. And attachment is to things that are outside of your control. I can control my actions, right? I can't even always control my thoughts, by the way, but I can start controlling the, you know, there's certain things that are within my range of control, but many of them are. And if my happiness is contingent by definition on something that's outside of me, everything is impermanent. So I'm going to lose it. So if you say, for example, Hey, my happiness is my income. Oh, I hit 10,000 this month. Oh, I didn't hit the next month. So you're, you're destined to be unhappy. Yeah. So you need to train yourself to be happy with those things that are internal. It's very difficult. But if you have that vision for yourself, you can do it. I'm on a journey to do that. I want to do that. That's something that I think will actualize me. I'm doing that. Yeah. Right. And so I would just encourage people to find that, that, that kind of uh, harmony because, you know, you are, it's really tough, really tough. I mean, you will always be able to compare yourself there. I can assure you I'm in Silicon Valley and I am like, you know, decently networked within a community of very successful people. And I can treat people that are, have a hundred million or $200 million who think they're abject failures or are not, you know, having a good personal life. I can show you people by the way, who are, have, have a billion who are very happy. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, people like to sell people with money aren't happy or people with money, you know, they like to create these truths. No, there are people with money who are happy. There are people without money who are happy. There are a lot of people along the spectrum, right? What works for you? Why do you need to look, look outside for things that might inspire you to find you? Like, for example, you see someone who's an actor or actress, or you see someone like you're moving to LA. I like, I think LA, I like the weather. I have a hypothesis. I, I like this. I'm going to try it. If I don't like it, I'm going to move. Yeah. Great. So you're going to learn. 
but you, you're moving towards the direction of your dreams, right? And you may be incorrect. Then you move towards it. If it's you're wrong, guess what? You move back. That's it. Yeah. It's all, it's, 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 yeah. It's, I mean, it's literally all like um, a stepping stone. Well, just think of it this way. It's all, it's all, 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 every experience that you have, in my opinion, is just an opportunity to learn about yourself, an opportunity to improve and go in the direction of yourself. I'm talking about your character. I'm talking about what your beliefs are. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about all this other stuff that's going to go away. Uh, well, okay, so if I have like a hundred million dollars and I die, I'm still dying. We're gonna yeah. die, right? Yeah. The same way, at least today. And so um, that is the equalizer. So I think if you, I think if you focus on those types of things, that you're in your sphere of control, you're a much more powerful person than if your 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 whole happiness is based on things that are outside, like those shoulds. So here's a question, because we've we've indirectly talked about money. Um, and we obviously both know the importance of money, especially for people who don't have money. Um, sure. What is your kind of your advice? Because, because I've, I've met as a coach, right. I've met the people who coach coaches because they are all in my DMS and they try to downplay money incessantly. And there have definitely been times in starting my business and getting to where I'm at now, where, um, I'm like, I may not pay rent this month. And that's a real thing. Right. And so, um, it's, it's frustrating when people who are more successful than you try to talk as if money is nothing and you just have to like manifest for more and then it'll just show up. Like when you are talking to, or when you've been in that early position of money is real and it is needed today, Uh, and you're like dealing with people now that are in the same position where they can't take their focus off of the money because, because it's a fear point. Um, How do you, what, what, what do you say to people or how did you deal with that space yourself? Because money it's it's tough because money will become very, uh, a, a fearful point for a lot of people, because the idea is that you may never have enough or you're always fighting for it, which I think inherently makes it an unhealthy relationship with money. Um, so like, what have your experiences been with that? It's a complex like topic. I think money has an evolving position in everyone's life, mm-hmm. right? And so I think to your point, you know, in particular when you're early in your career, maybe in a low point in your career, it plays a different role than if you're in a high point in your career or maybe you're older, right? Tend to be correlated. Um, I would say the following, anyone who tells you money doesn't matter. I think that's untrue. It just is untrue. Um, that's not the world we live in. If you want resources, you have to pay money for said resources. And so you have to try to figure out how to make money. So I think it's a critical part of life. That said, the amount of money that you need, that is a function of your wants and desires, right? Mm -hmm. So to the earlier discussion that we had prior, and I'm not suggesting this is a thing. If you're like, Hey, I want to have a family, right? I want to have two kids. There is a, there is a cost basis to that. Yeah. Right. And if you're like, well, then I want to have those two kids and I want to live in San Francisco versus Pittsburgh where we grew up again, it's a different cost basis. Right. And then you can start weighing, okay, well, it's more important to me have a family than it's in San Francisco. Okay, cool. So I think that you need to separate, um, to have the right relationship with money, right. Being right for you. You have to understand what your true, like, what are your fundamentals that you really need for happiness versus what are these like extra stuff we need to eat. We need to sleep. Uh, we need to make sure we have a roof over our head. Um, if you have kids, you likely want to help them with, you know, growing up, getting some exposure. Maybe you'll help them pay for college. Maybe you won't. Right. Like, but you have to figure out what those are for you. And then you work backwards from that and say, okay, well, how do I shape my life? How do I shape my dreams? Look, for some people, at least at the beginning, maybe their whole life. They won't, they won't be able to get past that stage because they're coming from uh, areas that are like tough. Maybe they just like didn't get that. I think a lot of people can break through past that. But I think anyone who says that that's not a reality for people is, is, is crazy. I mean, yeah. if you look at inequality in this country, it's, it's, it, it's at all time highs, right? I mean, you have like five people in the, in the, I mean, the Walton family alone, I think has more money than like 30% of like the bottom combined or something, yeah. right? Yeah. And so- that tells you everything you need to know. So um, I think the way, uh, but again, to have a healthy relationship with money, it all starts from knowing yourself and, and being able to say, okay, what am I attached to that I can like kind of separate and what's fundamental? And it's an evolving journey. It's, there's no, again, you're, 
I think people get upset. I had one guy's like, well, how do you know? I mean, some people just know themselves. I said, no, I don't think so. I think some people are more forgiving of the, of the fact that you're a process. You're not a thing, you're a process. And that's going to evolve as you get older. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to change. It's like, I can eat things that I wouldn't eat when I was younger, right? I couldn't eat shit when I was younger. You saw me, I was like a skinny little kid. Now I can eat anything. I, yeah. Well, it changed. It is yeah. what it is. So you're a process, you're evolving, you're changing, which means by definition, the things you want, the things you need are going to change. You just have to be willing to like respect yourself and take the time and say, hey, I'm going to take a minute. And like my list used to be ABC. Now it's like DEF. Yeah. That's it. But like, just take the time on yourself. And then I think you have a healthier relationship with money. Um, again, but like, if you want to, the, the surefire way to get tortured is, you know, the classic, I mean, hackneyed stuff, like go stare at Instagram, go follow like those top accounts and, and go ahead and see what you perceive to be their life, project that perfect life on there. And you're going to put yourself down. And then by for sure, you're not going to, you're going to hit any objective. I promise you, you're going to spend all your time feeling terrible and you don't even know those people. You have yeah. no idea where they're at. Like a lot of that's fake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I want to get a little more personal. So you recently got married. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you, uh, here's, a, here's a good question. You guys were dating for like 10 years. What, what, what took so long? What took so long? Um, a couple things. So, uh, it, we were actually engaged in 2018. So what do we met? We met on 3-1-13. So we were, it took us five years to get engaged. That's not that long, I think, but probably longer than she would want. Yeah, it's not crazy long. Five, six years. Um, and then COVID hit. And so we moved to our wedding, I think uh, three times. So yeah, I just got married. So I, I would, I, I can call it on the pandemic. Uh, I would say for the, for the, for the latter part, I think for the first part, you know, both of us were evolving and like learning where we're going. Cause we, we were in DC when we met and we moved to San Francisco. There was a lot of like settling in for both of us. Yeah. Um, but after that, I think things were pretty easy. Um, so when I, when I talk to my clients, one exercise that we do is we discuss the danger, the danger room. And what that is, is that mm-hmm. there is uh, a part of you that I believe whenever we experience uh, rejection, fears, traumas, all those things. We are, human beings are very good at compartmentalizing. And so we put a lot of that stuff into the danger room and it's our way of being like, I experienced it. I know like it's there and I also don't want to deal with it. And when we encounter situations, people, things that create a lot of anxiety within us and we aren't quite sure, my belief is that we are in that the hallway that leads to that door and there's a real possibility of that door flying open and what is behind there coming out, right? And so a lot of it is uh, what do I, what I do with some of my clients in the opportunity coaching space, not necessarily the performance coaching space, but in the opportunity coaching space is like, we're going to open that door. We're going to see what's in there. Maybe it's uh, a rejection when you were 17. Maybe it is the way that your parents talk to you. Maybe it is an assault or whatever. Um, And a lot of the fears that we have and traumas are, are packed away there. And the idea isn't necessarily to clean out the whole room, but to go in and, as you said, be curious and investigate what's in there and become very aware of what's in there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you have a a danger room, what do you think is in there? So, okay. Let me make sure I answer your question. Um, Mm -hmm. So when like, you're just saying like, is there like a trauma or something that was like tough that like is defining? Is, Is that a fair way to like, without count in that room, in that definition? Yeah. Uh, well, here's the thing though. Cause like, so I know that before I, I, I got healthy, a lot of like, you know, I was sexually assaulted twice. Both of those things were very much in that room. I didn't realize that they were still there though. I just knew that it was something that happened. I thought I let it go. But then when I started doing the work, I realized, oh no, it's still very much a part of me and still very much there. And it has actually, uh, uh, manipulated the way I interact in some romantic, uh, situations. I didn't realize it was still, it was okay. still showing up in my life. So when I did the breadcrumbing and I went back and I realized, oh no, it actually is here. Right. Um, I see. So it's yeah. like, it's not necessarily, okay. So in, in this particular, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the, the yeah, yeah. construct. So it'd be something that was, um, let's call it traumatic for lack of a better word, triggering, um, something you've had to deal with, but potentially the, the something that like maybe is you're still dealing with. 
Yes, you okay. you may versus versus something that like um, you you dealt with. It's hard, but like you you know you or you believe you've moved on. Yes, because that uh, wouldn't count. Yeah, because like the thing is, is that and the reason why we do the exercise is because a lot of people they will say, "I don't know why I react this way in a relationship. I I have no clue." And then when we do all the work, we realize, "Oh, it comes from this one instance, right?" Like, um, so for example, with me and my my desire to put a lot of people before me, I remember the day where I brought uh, my first like you know suicidal ideation to someone, and they kind of just dismissed it and everything from then kind of compounded onto it where I was like, oh, okay, I guess my job is just kind of sit back and shut up and I put other people first. Right. And so that's the idea. It's not necessarily you, cause you, I've gone into that room for myself. I've cleaned it out. Right. And I've organized everything. And when something comes up, I know exactly where it comes from. Um, but most people haven't. So yeah, I'm curious, is there anything that you would think? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, there's a couple that like, I think, I mean, God, I have so many things that I, I, I could refer to, but um, I'm just trying to think of ones that are, they're consistently manifesting in, in, in subtle ways. I, I think I've tried to have a healthier relationship with those. And I think I do, but I, I would say ones that I would, I could probably point to, you know, I think moving um, when I moved to, um, St. Clair actually from Mount Lebanon, that was really hard. Um, and I know that sounds, uh, probably like not as traumatic, but I'll, I'll tell you why, like at the time when we moved, it was like the Gulf war started. So, I mean, I, I experienced like, I guess racism. Yeah. And I, and I, I say that with like, you know, like, you know, like, sand and bomb or like making fun of me because I'm from Iraq and I'm not from Iraq and yeah. it was just strange I went from like a super I'd known people all my life I grew up in Mount Lebanon and then was my friend to like I didn't have friends and then all of a sudden everyone was like attacking me or that was my perception so that that was tough and I'm not I wasn't like a big kid um so just like it was I, I just felt cornered to be um, clear I don't think that you could be different in Upper St. Clair and not be so like your perception is probably very accurate and real <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I think the community there's changed quite a bit, but I mean, like, uh, when you're a minority, they're absolutely like a super, like minor, minor, like how many Persian people did you know? Like, <laughs> no. it's, it's just, <laughs> right. Um, and um, I think the other one would be like, then my parents got divorced around that time too. So we moved and then within like two years. So like, there was this, this period of, um, I would say isolation. I didn't have like a network, I didn't have a community and then the stability. I it wasn't having a home. So I felt like pretty like pretty much like there was no escape um, from, from that like feeling. And so I like, I think inherently, and I, I tell this a lot on entrepreneurs, like I think a lot of these traumas and that even immigration is a trauma. So my parents came here like they, and they passed that trauma is experience. And it's, and trauma is a word that's loaded. It obviously sounds only negative, but it can have positive outcomes if you take that and do something with it. So like 40% of fortune 500s are run or start by immigrants. Right. If you look at a lot of entrepreneurs, they have trauma in the background. Um, one of some of the most common car divorce and adoption and immigration. Those are the three that you see and big ones. I mean, I'm telling you big ones. So Jeff Bezos is adopted, right? Yeah. Steve Jobs is adopted. Larry Ellison is adopted. Huh. Right. Okay. Um, a lot of them had divorce. A lot of them had immigration. These are traumas. Like you basically have things that like your stability is fundamentally threatened at a young age. And so what do you do? You react to that trauma. You're trying to build stability. How do you build stability? I'm going to build a freaking empire around me. Nobody yeah. can get me. Right. Yeah. I'm going to, and, and I'm not saying that that's even conscious to them, but there's like this, you talk about resiliency, you talk about grit. Why? What's the driver underlying it? I do not want to feel that way. Yeah. Right. So I would say that like those two together were there. And then obviously my parents immigrating and us always having like, I mean, we were never like, you know, you know, Pittsburgh, it's, I have no, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's not worse or better than other places. Actually, we had a really good growing up, relatively speaking, right? Like, you know, and my parents, you know, were good parents, like, again, relatively speaking, like, so, but those, those kind of compounded, um, I think, and, and it led to kind of like a lot of like the behavior I had in high school and how I acted and then, you know. I would say those are the big ones. Um, yeah, I mean, and then like just the getting like after high school, 
or during the end of high school, just like trying to figure out what I wanted to do and being like left on my own after like I thought I had figured out who I was and I realized I was wrong. That was pretty tough. I would say those are like the big ones. Um, like I didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't really apply to college at the end of high school. Um, and, and I just didn't know. I just didn't, I just had skated. High school was like pretty easy. So yeah. I skated through partying, hanging out with your brother. Like we didn't, I didn't really, I just kind of did like whatever was like the bare minimum to get by. And I, and I was working in that system. And when the system was done and there was like, okay, there's no more system. You do whatever you want. It really was terrifying. I like didn't know what to do. And so I just really didn't apply to school. I ended up going to Pitt for the first year and I was pre-med, which like has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. Yeah. Like nothing to do with it. So when I, then all my friends, like I remember actually your brother was the first one to go because he was going uh, when he's going to West Point and we were on senior trip. I'll never forget this moment. And I hope he doesn't hate me for saying this, but like we were all there and uh, it, it was, uh, you know, all the guys that, that were, were uh, friends at that time. And he, we were crying. Everyone was crying when he's leaving. It was like really tough. And yeah. I realized this was the first, ever, He's at least he's going somewhere. He's picked something. I didn't pick shit. So then I watched each of my friends leave and then I ended up going to the a place I didn't, I didn't even consciously pick. I just kind of let life happen to me and I was subject and I had to deal with that outcome. And that was the first time I was like, oh my God, if I don't go and consciously choose my direction, this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get this. And it's not that Pitt was bad or med school was bad or people like, that's not my point. My point is I didn't want that. Yeah. I just didn't have the balls to sit down and say what I wanted. So if I sat down and I just like grinded and I was like, what do I want to do? And I just, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I really didn't, but I knew I liked computers and I knew that I didn't want to be there. And I knew like, and I picked a couple of parameters and that's like, I transferred to Penn and I started studying computer science. And like, that was the first step towards where I am now. Yeah. Right. And so that was the fine, but it was a really, really tough period for my life. Like I didn't drink all year. I didn't do anything bad. All I did was lift, study. That's it. Like period. I was just like, this is my time to like figure out myself. What is one fear that you used to have that you've finally let go of? Oh God. Let's see. What's a good fear? A good fear. What's a good one? No, I'm just, I'm just thinking. <coughs> like, um, what was I afraid of or what am I? I'm, I don't think you ever really let go of it. Maybe you just like, I don't know. Um, it's a fear. All right. Then what's, what is... Uh, I'm just trying to say, no, I have them. I have them. Give me a second. I, I just, I'm thinking, because this is, I want to know <laughs> what is a good fear. I, I think, I think one, and it's back to that original shit point and it's deep. I'm still like working away from that. I think like, I, I had like, am I living up to my potential? Am I, am I doing everything I can to actualize like I don't want to look back and say like I could have done more but then yeah. all of that again is relative to some standard and that standard is tends to be outside of myself now if that standard is my standard I'm okay with it so like it's tough you have to you want to be successful I believe you have to push yourself and you have to have a standard but you have to also recognize that you are a hundred percent going to miss that standard again one out of three one out of ten whatever your, your sport work analogy is right Mm -hmm. So like you can be committed to it. It's like an athlete, right? Like you're not, you, you just, some races, you're going to just have a shitty race. You know, it's like when you go out and have a lift or you have a run like today, I had a run. It was a shitty run. Yeah. I did it. I turned it in though. I did it. Yeah. yeah. I'm proud of myself for turning in and then I'll go tomorrow and I'll do it again. And maybe I'm, you know, the next day I'll have a better run. But like, you know, if you want to be a runner, you can have shitty days. I, you know, it, something that you just share in that fear uh, it's reminiscent for me, or it's personal for me, rather, just because one of the things that I realized uh, a little bit ago was that uh, my dad is someone who has been trying to be successful all of his life. Started this, failed that, started this, uh, you know, closed that, started this, the, whatever. And one of the things that has really hit me, especially being 36, <laughs> is that I'm like, you know, I don't want to be my dad's daughter, where I'm just constant, like, I don't want my tombstone to be, she was always trying, you know? Um, and so, which is, which is tough because it's one of those things of, I just never realized my full potential, or I kept buying into the idea that there was more potential than maybe there, there actually was. Um, you have mentioned grit a few times. What are three personal traits that you think has, ha has directly led to the success that you do have? 
I think there's a principle that is a value in my company. I, I mean, there's actually two that are important um, that are values in my company. And they're my values too. And I think they're really helpful. One, I think you have to have a people first mentality. Like at the end of the day, you have to care about people and others and have empathy and sympathy. Like, I think it's important. If you want to achieve anything great, you can't do it by yourself. Mm. It's not possible. It's just not possible. Even if you're a solo printer, well, you have to make your clients successful, mm. right? If you have a family. Well, if you have a partner, you know what I mean? Like, sorry, there's no, there's no solo game. Life is not solo. So I think you have to have this fundamental principle where you care about people, you're trying to lift them up, you're, 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 you're being good to them. I think the second I would say is, uh, there's this book called Kaizen um, that I read. It's, uh, it's a Japanese principle of continuous self-improvement. It's, uh, they use it in like the Toyota lean manufacturing, if you apply it. But the idea is very simple. It's, I'm always going to be improving. Like if I just do little things to improve every day, even if like every week I make one improvement, I'll move the trash can, I'll do whatever. Well, I'll have 52 improvements today. I'm better off. Right. Yeah. And so having this add to improvement, why is that important? Because it lets you improve. It also lets you fail because you know that you're not where you need to be. And then I'd say the third probably is just, you know, that resiliency. So if you care about people, if you're constantly learning and improving yourself so that you can work, do better things with those people, you're a better partner of those people and you can last a long fucking time, tend to do good things. All right. So I know that you are a busy guy. I'm going to bring it to an end. I only have two questions left for you. Okay. The first question is, how do you desire to better show up for others? How do I desire to better show up for others? I think the thing that I am always striving for is to be, um, I think, follow through, you know, do what I say, say what I do. And so I think so much of showing up for other people is just being consistent. Like, I think, I don't know, when we're children, I think we, we underappreciate how consistent our parents are, relatively speaking, right? Like you just assume yeah. your parents are always going to put food on the table. I don't, I doubt you ever thought that your parents are just going to be like, yeah, I forgot about dinner. I forgot yeah. about breakfast. I forgot to fill the fridge, right? Yeah. That is a gift. If you can be that for other people where you're that consistent and you're there and you're reliable and your source of stability in an inherently unstable world, I think it's a gift. Um, I, I do tell my clients that one of the really great opportunities of setting boundaries and adhering to them is that not only are you consistent and you know how you're going to show up for things, but other people also know how you're going to show up for things, which uh, people like that. And the yeah. last question is, how do you desire to better show up for yourself? I think I, 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 every, I think so like one of, so a friend of mine, this guy, Justin Kahn, um, he had started Twitch and um, really nice guy. He has like really interesting content that he puts out now. He spends a lot of time on YouTube, but um, we had breakfast one morning and he, we were just sharing, we were really into like, you know, life improvement and, and, and like meditation and all these different things, right? So I asked him, you know, what's a habit that you, you've adopted that's changed your life? And he, he pulled out this app and it's a five minute journal. I think it's just called journal now. And it's a gratitude journal. And literally it'll ask you simple prompts like, okay, what are three things you're grateful for? Um, what are a couple things that you'll do today to make today great? What's your affirmation? And I looked at this thing and I'm, I'm pretty open-minded, but like inherently I have resistance. I'm like, this is fucking dumb. Like, yeah. and I told him, and I just thought like, this is so hokey. Like how could this impact? It was so small, right? Yeah. It wasn't the practice of gratitude. It was even the journaling. I didn't want it to journal. And actually, I think I expressed them that I've, I've been failing journaling. Yeah. And that was, I think, what it, might have what it triggered it. I, it was, and so I said, all right. He said, just try it. I do it every day. I've done it for, I think, almost five years. And I can tell you, like, the single most, one of the most impactful things that has shaped my perspective. Because now I'm, like, starting my day with, like, looking at positive. And it's training me in my brain. I end the day with it, too. And you train your brain to say, like, look. You don't have rose colored glasses in the sense of like, you're ignoring, like getting hit by a car, for example, right? Like yeah. it's not positive. Like you don't want that to happen. That said, there's so many good things that happen in your life. And you just don't like the fact that if you go for a walk, for example, and it's a beautiful day, so many things had to be true to make that walk happen. Like in, I'm in San Francisco, there's no earthquake, right? I'm serious. Like there's no earthquake. 
the sun is the right distance from the earth. Thank God, you know, yeah. that it can do that. Um, it's, it's like, there's a million, I have clothes, I have shoes, I have time. Like yeah. a million things have to be true for that moment. A million, a billion have to be true for that moment where you're just relaxed. And to start to train yourself to appreciate those moments, it doesn't mean that you have rose colored glasses. It just means you actually are like looking at reality. And so I think that's the thing that I'm investing in the most. And that comes with also forgiveness. That comes with saying like, hey, listen, man, like chill out. It's all good. Like I can't work anymore tonight. I have like an hour more of work and just saying, well, I can't. And it's okay, I'm going to bed. So I think gratitude and forgiveness are those two are. I like that. Um, Human, thank you so much for, for being on. This was really great conversation. I can't wait to share it with everybody. Um, and you are very awesome. So thank you so fun, very, very much. No, I'm happy to be here and anytime. Let's do it again. Awesome. Um, thank you again to everybody that listened to Show Up with Sarah and have a great day.